semester, uh, our medical students, University of Utah will be kicking, kicking it off. It's nice to see some uh, suits and ties out there. Uh, and, and if you are a medical student not wearing a suit and tie, that is also very acceptable uh, as well. Uh, our residents will be doing our introductions today. I believe it, it may be RN11 and uh, Dr. Levin, I apologize if I'm mistaken. Can, can Ariana be unmuted? I just made her co-host so she can unmute. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, uh, we've had a little change of schedule here, so let me get organized. Um, okay, I think that we have all University of Utah students this morning, and our first presentation will be Michael Sawyer, who's a fourth year medical student presenting a nine-year-old female with corneal vascularization. Go for it, Michael. You're muted. How's that? Good. Perfect. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited for this presentation. Uh, I have loved this ophthalmology rotation so far, and it's just been a lot of fun. The faculty have been excellent, um, and it really is an honor to be at the Moran Eye Center. Uh, it's also been a privilege to work with Sam and Taylor on this uh, rotation so far, and I'm excited to hear their presentations this morning as well. Uh, so I am presenting today on a nine-year-old female with corneal vascularization. Uh, this is a girl who came into our clinic. Uh, my, my slides are not, here we go. This is a girl who came into our clinic uh, as an outside optometry referral. She has uh, corneal opacities and corneal vascularization, and she also has a three-year history of recurrent styes and blepharitis. Uh, mom reports that she's had some pain in her eyelids, some swelling in her eyelids, as well as eyelid crustiness, and she's had a pretty significant decrease in her vision on, in both eyes. Uh, some significant negatives to her history is that she does not get uh, cold sores orally, and she does not have a history of glasses or contact lenses, no surgical history, and she also does not have any known recent trauma. They've tried antibiotic uh, eye drops for previously, not sure which kind, uh, and they're trying to wash her lids daily at the moment. On base eye exam, her right eye is 2100 vision, her left eye has 2400 vision. Both eyes improve to uh, roughly 2070 with pinhole. We're able to refract her right eye to 2080 with a negative 0.75 sphere, and uh, the left eye we don't have any improvement uh, with refraction for distal visual acuity. The rest of her exam is pretty normal. Um, no, other, uh, no other abnormalities uh, in the base eye exam. Here's a slit lamp exam photo of her right eye. Uh, starting externally, we don't see any active signs of uh, current sty. However, looking at the eyelid margins, we do see some meibomian gland dysfunction here, uh, mainly on the upper eyelid. Going to the conjunctiva, it is hyperemic. And um, on the cornea, we see some opacities, uh, some punctate keratitis, uh, which we can see in the glare of the cornea, and definitely some vascularization. Uh, mainly on the lower half of the cornea. Here's another view of the same eye just to help us appreciate the opacities uh, with the light at a different angle, as well as to appreciate the vascularization a little bit better. Looking at the left eye, uh, externally the uh, lid does not have any uh, current styes that we can see, uh, but there is again some meibomian gland dysfunction uh, I've indicated with the arrows here because it can be hard to see over the internet. And uh, both on the upper and lower eyelid, we have a hyperemic conjunctiva and uh, as well as uh, corneal vascularization with opacities here. Looking at the nasal uh, cornea, there might be a flictenule there that we see too. Here's a slit lamp at a different angle here. Uh, and this I thought was helpful because it shows that the vascularization 
uh, may extend down into the stromal layer of the cornea on that nasal side uh, in this area. So our differential diagnosis, we have a, a nine-year-old patient with corneal vascularization and opacities. Uh, it can be pretty wide. I split the differential into four main categories. I'm sure that there's a variety of ways to do this. Uh, but we felt that from her history and physical exam that uh, blepharoconjunctivitis was the most likely diagnosis and decided to treat for that. So uh, we decided to treat right away um, since her significantly was impaired and she was given erythromycin drops in both eyes uh, every night, as well as Tobradex four times a day, and then just standard treatment for uh, dry eye and uh, encouraging her to uh, have eyelid scrubs on a daily basis. We scheduled a follow-up for three weeks. In three weeks, uh, they come back. Mom has noted some subjective improvement. Uh, her eyelids are not quite as crusty anymore, and they're pretty compliant with the treatment. Uh, However, the patient is pretty resistant to the ointment at times. Visual acuity has improved to 2050 bilaterally, and her pressure is still looking pretty good at follow-up. So lamp exam, here's the right eye. We see some very significant improvement, a lot less vascularization than there was a few weeks ago. Still some opacities uh, that uh, look like they could be obstructing the visual axis, and uh, a little bit of vascularization still on the temporal cornea here. Uh, the conjunctiva is uh, less uh, distressed than it seemed a few weeks ago as well. Here's the right eye again, just with the light at a different angle to help us appreciate the opacities a little bit better. Uh, again, still pretty improved from last time. Looking at the left eye, uh, we have uh, maybe some mild meibomian gland dysfunction here in the upper eyelid that I've indicated with an arrow. The conjunctiva is looking uh, better, less inflamed. And then the cornea uh, does still have quite a few opacities. Vascularization is uh, quite a bit down, although still present. And if you were to see this slit lamp in person, uh, you'd be able to appreciate that this vessel here on the central cornea is still functioning and patent uh, based on the fact that we see red blood cells uh, flowing through uh, this vessel, which for me as a medical student, uh, seeing that for the first time was pretty exciting. Uh, not something that I get to see on a daily basis at this point in my training. So uh, I, I really love this slip lamp uh, exam here. Uh, here's the same eye just with the light at a different angle to help us see those opacities pretty well. So our assessment is that the patient was uh, responding well to treatment. Her pressure uh, looks good. She's tolerating the steroids well, so we decided to continue the same treatment and have the patient follow up in six weeks. Uh, this patient has blepharokeratoconjunctivitis, which is pretty common in pediatric ophthalmology clinics. Uh, this review from Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia showed that over a five-year period, uh, blepharokeratoconjunctivitis, which I'll just call BKC from here on out, it's a a pretty big mouthful, uh, but it was actually the most common referral diagnosis for patients in their clinic. So uh, I, the reason I chose this case out of all the cases I could have chosen uh, is because for me, as someone who's relatively new to the field of ophthalmology, it was really exciting to see a patient go from being essentially legally blind uh, to being at almost driving vision within just a few weeks. And on top of that, the really fascinating physical exam findings, uh, seeing the corneal vascularization and the cells running through the vessels made this a very memorable case for me. Um, and as I've told some people, if uh, this is considered a more common uh, and routine case in ophthalmology, then by all means, this is a pretty exciting field. So I think BKC is really worth talking about for a variety of reasons. Um, one being that corneal vascularization is uh, not an uncommon thing. Uh, it's estimated that there are about 1.4 million cases of corneal vascularization seen per year in clinics. About 20% of corneal transplant specimens have some sort of vascularization on them. Uh, 
And then with PKC, as we've seen, uh, patients can have pretty rapid response to treatment. However, left untreated, you can have very detrimental outcomes. So it's absolutely crucial to have uh, timely and proper treatment for this condition, especially in children uh, where they can develop really deleterious complications if, uh, if it's left alone for too long. And we'll be talking about those in a second. Uh, but BKC essentially comes down to the stability of the tear film lipid layer. Uh, and that can be caused uh, by either meibomian gland dysfunction or by bacterial lipases in an infection that can further destabilize the lipid layer. Uh, in our patient, we saw, probably saw a combination of both of these uh, pathophysiologies going on. Once you have a destabilized tear film, uh, you get dry, evaporative dry eye, which causes inflammation leading to vascularization in places where we don't want it. And so that leads to the treatment. We want to treat the underlying cause of the inflammation as well as the inflammation itself. Something I found interesting is that although uh, BKC can be a fairly routine presentation in the clinic, and there is a lot of research about the treatments for BKC, there's not actually a standardized like official uh, treatment regimen for the condition. Uh, here we see, I, I just put the titles of uh, two Cochrane reviews about BKC that um, done by similar groups of authors. And out of all the literature they reviewed, they actually found that um, between these two studies, only one uh, study actually fit inclusion criteria for their study. And mainly because most studies don't have a proper uh, control treatment arm and uh, other ones mix children and adults in their treatments. And so uh, they weren't actually able to make any recommendations for treatment of BKC. That being said, the consensus is pretty wide throughout the field that topical steroids and topical antibiotic, antibiotics along with um, treatment with, for dry eye is uh, pretty widely accepted. Uh, so some additional treatments uh, that are, are less common but uh, plausible is that for patients who are steroid responders or otherwise intolerant of steroids, a calcineurin inhibitor uh, could be used as a steroid sparing agent. Uh, as a treatment for STI, something that's become more popular in the last few years is hypochlorous acid spray or brand name Avanova. Uh, this is something that patients can buy over the counter and a lot of people tend to like it. Uh, and then research is uh, showing increasing support for essential fatty acids in the diet. They can have an anti-inflammatory effect and may help with dry eye and chronic blepharitis. So recommending flaxseed oil is certainly a possibility in a patient like this. Uh, similar presentations, common things being common, we don't want to forget about HSV keratitis. This is especially important since one of the mainstays of treatment for BKC is uh, steroids. Uh, we could obviously make HSV a lot worse by treating for BKC if it were concurrent or if it were the actual cause of this patient's symptoms. On the other hand, some providers uh, may be hesitant to treat for BKC out of concern that there is keratitis present. Um, so a good way to get around this is with concurrent steroids and acyclovir, basically treating each condition at once. Um, we decided not to give this patient acyclovir simply because her history and exam were uh, very indicative of BKC. Um, we weren't as worried about keratitis. However, based on my reading, I don't think it would be frowned upon to give a patient prophylactic acyclovir if they were in this situation. So some important complications, especially in pediatric patients, um, with the corneal involvement, we can develop an, an irregular astigmatism. Um, another cause of this is simply because of the eyelid issues with the uh, uh, chronic chalazia um, can also cause an irregular astigmatism. And then with the obstruction of visual axis or with the astigmatism, uh, pediatric patients commonly develop amblyopia from this condition. And that's definitely something that we need to keep an eye out for this patient. Um, and of course, we're walking a fine line between uh, managing the inflammation in this patient's eye, but also making sure her eye pressure uh, doesn't get too high. So that's another important reason for regular follow-up. 
with that in mind, some considerations we have for this patient is uh, to have corneal topography in the future to make sure to, to see whether this patient develops in an astigmatism and of course keep her pressures in check. Um, another thing to consider as we saw from the follow-up is that uh, most children don't like things going in their eyes and that can lead to really difficult compliance in children. So although this is a very treatable condition, um, some patients may have deleterious uh, outcomes simply because they're refusing treatment despite the best meaning parents. Prognosis in BKC, as I've hinted, can be pretty good. Um, this is a study in 2007 by a, a, a group of researchers who um, found that on average, their patients ended up with 20-20 vision at the end of the study. That being said, 30% 30, 30 of patients did not have improvements in visual acuity and over half of the patients did develop amblyopia that required ongoing treatment. Um, so I think this shows that BKC, while it is um, a relatively routine presentation in pediatric ophthalmology clinics, does require um, really prompt treatment. And uh, it's something that either with misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis can lead to really bad outcomes. Um, and uh, I just really love this case. Um, you know, they, they say when at this point in my academic career, when you're thinking about specialties, uh, think about the, the common standard, even mundane things about a specialty and imagine yourself doing that on a daily basis. Um, and boy, if this is uh, an example of that in ophthalmology, then this is a pretty exciting field. Uh, the zebras of every field, I think, are, are fascinating and exciting. Uh, but it's also nice to admire the glamorous, beautiful horses uh, right in front of us. And uh, for me, that was an example of that. So uh, this was just a good opportunity to reflect on that. Thanks so much for listening to my presentation. Special thanks to everyone on this slide. Uh, I couldn't have uh, prepared this presentation without any of these uh, people. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael. This is Dr. Olson. Uh, uh, a few comments. Uh, uh, the, the cornea has evolved to uh, be fairly resistant to vascularization for obvious reasons because uh, vascularization is uh, obviously bad for vision and bad for survival. And yes. So uh, there is a, there's a, a system that's been worked out and uh, uh, part of inflammation is uh, uh, almost always upregulation of VEGF, and it doesn't take much of that for corneas to be vascularized, but there's a system called FLT2, which uh, uh, resists that. So uh, a couple of things with kids that are important is it, it's obvious that, that when you breach that system, it can, it can go dramatically fast. I mean, I, I've, I've seen cases where it was just early neovascularization. They were lost to follow up, and a month later, the corneas were hugely vascularized. So that's one reason why you got to get on top of kids very, very fast. Um, and once they are vascularized, you can look carefully, and you'll see these ghost vessels that are still there. And that's true for all of the different conditions. You know, uh, zoster, herpes. Uh, you know. Uh, Luetic and interstitial keratitis, and it takes very little uh, new inflammation those open up. So you really got to watch these kids carefully. And of course, the secondary effect if you've got vascularized corneas is that you'll end up getting scarring. A lot of that white deeper stuff is just you know true scarring in the cornea. It's it's now an altered architecture, and so that's something that also needs to be watched very carefully. But the other side is, is that uh, um, it, because kids are hard to check and they're hard to do with pressure, uh, we see an awful lot of kids who not only have steroid glaucoma, and dexamethasone has been well shown to be the one most likely to lead to steroid uh, you know, uh, glaucoma, but uh, easily lead to cataracts. And we often see these in uh, more of the allergic conditions where people have been treated and they're not getting good control. Uh, steroids are extremely effective uh, for uh, this condition, and uh, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you've got uh, you know you've got a steroid-induced cataract, which is uh, uh, not reversible at that particular point, and that can be a real problem. So, 
there, even though we deal with blepharoconjunctivitis so commonly in adults, and many of the things are going to be very, very similar, kids are quite different. So I think you, you raise those points, but it's, it's always a shame to let it get to the point where you know, you've got pretty profound vascularization. But that, those are some of the things to think about with this tough condition. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Uh, our, we'll save additional questions or comments until the end of the presentations to make sure that each presenter has uh, enough time. So thank you so much, Michael. Our next presenter is Samuel Wilkinson, another fourth year medical student who will be presenting ocular syphilis. Uh, as our speakers speak, you can also place questions in the chat. Okay, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Um, perfect. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Sam Wilkinson, and I'm a fourth-year medical student here at the University of Utah. Today, I'm going to present a case of ocular syphilis seen in Dr. LaRochelle's uveitis clinic. This particular patient was a 64-year-old female with no significant ocular history who presented to the Moran Triage Clinic with two months of a worsening black spot in the center of her vision of her left eye. She also reported intermittent flashing lights as well as blurred vision in her left eye, but did not have any symptoms in her right eye. Her past ocular and medical history is non-contributory. Her family history was significant for a father who lost vision from age-related macular degeneration, and no family history of autoimmune disease. Social history is significant for a history of incarceration, but otherwise low risk. Pertinent positives and negatives from review of systems includes hip pain and muscle aches, Patient also reported occasional urinary urgency and diarrhea. Patient denies any rash or genital sores. Vision in the affected eye was decreased to 2200 without improvement with pinhole and pupils and pressure were normal. The right eye had a cataract but was otherwise normal. The affected eye had findings of mild anterior chamber reactivity with posterior sneaky eye and a few pigmented cells in the vitreous. Here is an optos photo of the right eye. As you can see here, the right eye is significant for a small nevus just outside the supratemporal uh, arcade. And this is an optos photo of the left eye. It is remarkable for a placoid yellowish lesion in the posterior pole. Notably on our fundus exam, there was a cluster of punched out spots inferiorly that cannot be visualized with this image. And here we see a fundus autofluorescence imaging of the left eye. And in that same location on the posterior pole, there's this placoid hyperintensity. The top image here is a MAC OCT from the right eye. As you can see, it is normal. And the bottom image shows the left eye. Right here, there's loss of the ellipsoid zone. See here as well as retinal pigment epithelium irregularities seen here and here. Next, we have fluorescein angiography of the left eye. This image is of the earlier arteriovenous phase. Initially, it is relatively normal, but if we move forward to a later phase, it shows hyperfluorescence in the area of the placoid lesion, as well as staining of the overlying vessels and late leakage peripherally. Here we have a mid-phase ICG of the left eye. These are, there are a few hypofluoresced spots in the posterior pole. At this point, we describe this as a subacute unilateral panuveitis due to the anterior chamber reactivity, pigmented vitreous cell, and macular lesion. Our differential at this point was placoid syphilis versus non-infectious or inflammatory posterior uveitis. An initial laboratory workup returned two days later with a positive RPR titer and positive FDA ABS. No other abnormalities were found on lab work. Patient was admitted to the hospital for IV penicillin, infectious disease consult, and a neurosyphilis workup due to the ocular involvement. 
She completed a two-week course of IV penicillin. A lumbar puncture was remarkable for elevated white blood cells. And uh, notably, the VDRL of the CSF was negative. Regardless, this is still treated as neurosyphilis due to ocular involvement. Additionally, the elevated white blood cells do raise suspicion. Of, um, and notably, she was HIV negative. Patient had a follow-up ophthalmology appointment one month after the initial presentation. And at that follow-up, her exam, uh, her visual acuity improved from 2200 to 2050. And here are Optos color photos of the left eye from the initial visit on the left, and then right next to it is the one month follow-up. As you can see, the placoid lesion that we originally saw is resolving. This difference in color between the photographs is just an artifact. And this is fundus autofluorescence of the left eye. Uh, similarly, uh, there's near resolution of the hyperfluorescent uh, placoid lesion seen here as well. And an OCT of the left eye shows that the photoreceptors have returned and there's been some normalization of the retinal pigment epithelium. So the final diagnosis is acute syphilitic posterior placoid chorioretinitis or ASPPC. Patient will follow up with ophthalmology as well as infectious disease to ensure definitive treatment of this patient's syphilis. As syphilis can present in the eye in a wide variety of ways. Of all the presentations, uveitis is the most common. This particular presentation of ASPPC was first described by Dr. Donald Gass in 1990. And the key clinical findings of ASPPC are a yellowish placoid lesion within the macula, patchy disruption of the ellipsoid zone, and a hyperreflective nodular lesions in the retinal pigment epithelium. It is more commonly seen in immunocompromised individuals, although still possible in immunocompetent patients as seen in today's case. In uveitis patients with suspected ASPPC, the workup should include a high specificity test such as FDA ABS, and nonspecific tests such as RPR and VDRL are negative in about one third of ocular syphilis cases. Uh, the prognosis is variable. Spontaneous resolution is possible. However, loss of retinal function is also possible when left untreated. Patients do respond well to treatment as seen in today's case. Treatment typically includes IV penicillin G, 24 million units daily for 10 to 14 days. And syphilis has been rising the past decade. Uh, the US has had the highest number of new syphilis cases since 1991. So this is an important diagnosis to keep in, uh, in your mind with any uveitis patient, but especially with these characteristic findings. I just want to say a special thank you to Dr. La Rochelle uh, for help on this presentation, as well as for all of her mentorship. Um, and for introducing me to clinical ophthalmology. Um, and a thank you to Dr. Abigail Jevaraj for helping me obtain some of these photos. And if there are any questions, happy to answer those. Great, thank you, Sam. Uh, we probably do have time for one question before we move on, if someone has one. Otherwise, as you're thinking of questions and putting them in the chat, our third presenter is Taylor Brady, a fourth year medical student who will be presenting an otherwise healthy newborn with an anterior segment lesion. Thank you, Ariana. Um, let me back up here. So, um, appreciate the time. I'm gonna talk about an otherwise healthy uh, newborn with an anterior segment lesion. Um, Michael and Sam, thank you for your presentations. They were great. Um, I have no disclosures for this presentation, so let's jump into it. Um, just to first cover the patient specifically, she's now two years old, but um, uh, presented at two months old. She was otherwise healthy, uh, born at full term. Um, she had this irregular iris border in her left eye that you can see here in this image. Um, this clear kind of inferior nasal lesion with ectropia on UVA that you can see here. She also had lens coloboma, um, which you can't see in this particular image because it's posterior to the iris. 
um, didn't have any pertinent family history. And our uh, initial differential diagnosis includes a ciliary body or iris cyst or a neoplasm um, or a coloboma, uh, PHPV, aniridia, uh, trauma or NAT, um, or potentially a juvenile xanthogranuloma. This was uh, concerning, so she was sent for um, an EUA and ultrasound. Here's actually an A scan and a B scan, similar to what our patient received. Uh, she, at Primary Children's, got an A and B scan with, uh, with Dr. Harry, and unfortunately, we went over there to retrieve those images, and the, the ultrasound machine at Primary Children's is broken, so we weren't able to pull them off. But this is a very similar presentation in another patient. See in the A scan this increased signaling um, behind the cornea and the iris, suggesting a location of this lesion, which is in the ciliary body. Um, and in the B scan, you can see the, the location actually located in the cili ciliary body. Um, it's important to know that this particular B scan is taken at a very steep angle, so it makes the posterior chamber um, look a lot more shallow than it actually is. And if you look at the lesion closely, you can note that there's this solid consistency of the mass. Uh, and when you compare that to other ciliary body growths, they're typically more cystic in nature and appearance. And so that's something to note when you see these types of presentations. Um, this was concerning for medulloepithelioma. Um, and so this patient was referred to ocular oncology, Dr. Jonathan Kim, um, who's a great ocular oncologist um, at USC. He actually diagnosed her with medulla epithelioma after his own ultrasound and exam under anesthesia. And that's actually the best method to diagnose these tumors. We don't want to biopsy them uh, because there's a large risk of, re of uh, seeding or causing a hemorrhage. Now, our patient had a, a fairly typical presentation for medulla epithelioma when it does show up. The typical presentation includes a lens coloboma, which you can see in this image here. Um, and this actually arises interestingly because of congenital absence of the zonule in the area of the ciliary body where the tumor is located. Um, and the tumor actually is typically uh, inferotemporal, although in our particular patient, it was inferonasal. Um, you can see a clear to flesh tone mass arising from the ciliary body. Uh, there's often small clear cysts that are present within the mass. Um, and sort of like retinoblastoma, it can also have these calcifications depending on um, any embryonic tissue that's contained in the tumor and, and kind of depending on its histopathologic characteristics. Um, it's often covered in a cyclitic membrane. Uh, there can be secondary glaucoma resulting from um, ankle, ankle closure. There could be lens subluxation if the mass is actually pressing into the lens. And ectropian UVA, as we can see in our patient, uh, they can also have leukocoria, which is one of the main reasons it's important to differentiate these tumors from retinoblastoma. And, you know, one of the concerns is that a, oftentimes uh, patients undergo a workup for cataract or glaucoma, something else that's secondary to the medullary epithelioma, and they get treated for that. They've even, there's even been cases of people having surgery for glaucoma, surgery for um, on the vitreous, surgery for cataracts, um, things like that, and then um, having a medullo epithelioma found incidentally during the surgery. Here's an image um, that shows leukocoria in a five-year-old female with uh, medullo epithelioma. You can also note with this arrow the neovascularization of the neoplastic cyclitic membrane, so that's, that's a good image. Um, and a, here's a growth, uh, gross uh, pathology specimen it's an example of a large medulloepithelioma after enucleation. And you can notice the lens subluxation and then all this retinal detachment that's happened. So this can be an incredibly morbid disease. Histopathology, I think, is really interesting in these tumors. Um, they typically arise from the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body. And they are classified into teratoid versus non-teratoid and also benign versus malignant. The majority of them are malignant or have malignant potential, regardless of whether they're teratoid or non-teratoid um, and their classification there. The non-teratoid here, or there, uh, another, no, another name, um, an older nomenclature you may know them as is a dictyoma. It has this characteristic kind of net-like proliferation of these neoplastic cells. And then the teratoid uh, medulloepitheliomas can have 
a bunch of diverse cell origin. See here is actually a really distinct focus of hyaline cartilage um, that you can see within those tumors. There's a couple other examples here, um, a couple other uh, histology images, and these are both from teratoid medulloepitheliomas as well. The image on the left uh, resembles skeletal muscle um, and, tish and uh, malignancies that can be found in, in skeletal muscles, such as a rhabdomyosarcoma. And the image on the, on the right resembles uh, neural or brain tissue. Some of the complications of malignant uh, medulloepithelioma can include extraocular extension and orbital invasion, which typically cause significantly increased morbidity for these patients. Regional lymph node extension does occur and is um, most common if there's extraocular extension. Uh, distant metastases are pretty rare. CNS extension is also really rare, but if we encounter a patient that has this metastases or CNS extension, that is almost always fatal, unfortunately. So in, in discussing this presentation with Dr. Jardine, something that he brought up and I think is a really, really um, prudent way to approach these cases um, and, and, and applies to most of general oncology as well, is to take kind of this stepwise approach. Um, you know, we're mostly foremost concerned about the patient and their survival. We want them to be able to live. Secondly, we want to preserve their eye and then we want to preserve their vision. And you know, in a lot of pediatric tumors, intraocular tumors, the fourth step here is to preserve their binocularity if we can. So we approach this in a stepwise fashion. Um, and I think this is a great um, method of thinking through the treatment of these tumors. So for preservation of life, I think um, it's appropriate to kind of compare medulloepithelioma to retinoblastoma, which is a tumor we're all um, much more familiar with. Um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, medulloepithelioma is incredibly rare. I spoke with Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Harry. Dr. Hoffman says he's seen maybe five to six cases of this in his career. Dr. Harry said he's seen about 12 of them. Um, whereas with retinoblastoma, it, there's two to 300 new cases per year in the United States. Um, medulloepithelioma manifests in the first decade of life almost always. And um, retinoblastoma before the age of five. For metastatic risk, medulloepithelioma has a low metastatic risk, but the challenge is that it's uncommon. Um, and there's often a delay in diagnosis because, well, for a couple of reasons. One is we're just not looking for it as much. Um, the other is that it's, diff it's easy to miss. If you know, if it's in the ciliary body, it's posterior to the iris, it can be difficult to see there. Um, but when it's caught early, it is really, it, it does have a lower metastatic risk. Um, in contrast, retinoblastoma has a higher metastatic risk, but, you know, family medicine doctors, um, pediatricians, we're all trained to look for this um, and catch it really easy, really early when we see leukocoria in a, in a kid. Um, and so it's typically caught early. Survival rates are, are pretty similar. Um, in a recent study for medulloepithelio on medulloepithelioma, post-enucleation, there was a 90 to 95% five-year survival if the extension was just in the globe. Um, and with retinoblastoma, it was 96% five-year five -year survival. Um, there's some risk for other cancers. In medulloepithelioma, most of these are non-hereditary, uh, but there is a 5% risk of a specific genetic mutation uh, that contributes to several other tumors or cancers that can happen um, in that patient's life. But that's pretty, it's a rare, uh, rare mutation in an already rare cancer. Um, and then we, of course, we know about um, germline RB1 mutations associated with pineal and bone tumors in patients with retinoblastoma. So the next step in that stepwise approach is preservation of the eye. So the big question is, can we avoid a nucleation? With medulloepithelioma, sometimes we can, but it's really important to catch it early if we want to give the patient a chance. Um, unfortunately, enucleation is still currently the standard of care for advanced medulloepithelioma because it's often caught so late. Um, if it's large, if there's glaucoma, if there's significant global involvement, um, almost always have to have enucleation. Um, and if there's any orbital involvement, you need to get even more morbid and move on to exenturation, which can be off for these patients. Luckily in our patient, she had this relatively small lesion 
Um, it was about three clock hours. It was no, no significant involvement of the globe. It wasn't causing any other complications like glaucoma or lens subluxation. Um, and she was able to be treated with plaque radiotherapy. Uh, placement of the plaque for her with Dr. Kim was in the inferior nasal area um, in proximity to her tumor. And this patient is a great example of how early detection can, can contribute to preservation of the eye and avoidance of enucleation. So some complications she had uh, with plaque radiotherapy, she had two muscles moved in order to have the plaque placed and her inferior rectus of the left eye was not resutured to the insertion. Um, she developed worsening strabismus over time. And keep in mind, this is two years ago that she started, she was uh, diagnosed. Um, she also developed a radiation induced cataract in that same eye. She started to develop amblyopia. Their thought is that she, this is a multifactorial cause. You know, she's got a tumor, she's got strabismus, she's got a cataract, she's been go undergoing radiation. Um, her parents have been patching her two to three hours a day for the past two years, but unfortunately, it hasn't been incredibly effective to this point. She's also developed this strabismus, which is exacerbated by the surgery she's had, um, exacerbated by the plaque radiotherapy and the movement of those muscles. Um, she's had to undergo two strabismus surgeries uh, with Dr. Jardine. And the question about what caused the strabismus is, is is difficult to quantify, unfortunately. And, and also the question, how much is it actually contributing to her amblyopia at this point? Um, is it a congenital cause? Is, there a sensor, is it a sensory cause because of her cataract, um, because of the radiation, or there, is there permanent damage to the muscles that's causing it? And uh, my thought and our thought is that it's most likely multifactorial as well. So here's an image that you can see of this eye uh, during our most recent EUA. You can actually make out the cataract here faintly. Um, and you can see that it's more of this flesh toned. It's, it's, it looks like it's evolved. I'm not sure if this is because of evolution of the tumor or because of uh, just the, the differences in the camera, differences in the, in the picture quality, but the measurements are actually about the same here. And the main thing to do um, with these particular tumors is to ensure that they're not continuing to grow. And the measurements have been the same, they've been stable. And so that's the main goal, especially with this patient. Next steps for her are uh, cataract surgery. And you know that's concerning, looking at that tumor, we're gonna enter the eye with that uh, neovascularization. It's, that's quite a worry. It's something that Dr. Jardine and I have talked quite a bit about. Um, there's a big worry for a neovascular hemorrhage within her orbit. Um, considering also doing some Avastin treatment in her anterior chamber before the operation. Um, and then the other thing is to monitor these for reoccurrence. Um, it's unfortunate, but oftentimes people who have uh, local resection or other um, non-enucleation surgeries for these tumors end up needing an enucleation anyway because of recurrence. So that's something we really need to watch. Thank you for the time. I feel very you know, I feel very lucky that I actually got to see a, a patient with such a rare cancer that um, is not often seen um, in just the last couple of weeks. A special thank you to Dr. Jardine, Dr. Harry, Dr. Hoffman, and Dr. Vagunta who have helped me out so much with this. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, Taylor. We did have a question come into the chat. The question is whether A scan or B scan is more helpful or whether it's a combination in cases like these. Uh, Taylor, you're welcome to answer. And I think we also have Dr. Harry uh, in here as well. Yeah, so Dr. Harry could probably answer this better than me, but I, I think that a combination of the two is typically the way that they're, these are diagnosed. Uh, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You're good. Very nice presentation, Taylor. Um, yeah, the question A and B scan, uh, A scan is really superior in the posterior segment. For melanomas, uh, anything posteriorly, it really uh, gives more information than the B scan. I use them both, but I depend on the A scan more. The anterior segment is different just because of uh, angle, usually size of tumor are smaller. You don't get internal reflectivity uh, patterns as well. So I depend more on the B scan, the anterior segment. And unfortunately, because the machine was sent out for repair, like you said, we didn't have the images from this case, but uh, the immersion high-frequency ultrasound is very helpful too. Um, 
this case shows a regular 10 megahertz B scan. The, uh, the picture you show is just a regular 10 megahertz. You can see the tumor, but to really see detail, the high frequency uh, machine is, is better. But for residents going into practice, if you have access to an ultrasound machine without the high frequency, you can still use the 10 megahertz. You have to use immersion scan of some kind. I use a little scleral shell. You can put a tonal pen cover on the tip. You can use a cut a glove tip off and use that to make an immersion and, and visualize the entire segment. But that's really important. And just one comment about uh, dictiomas, they can be masquerade kinds of lesions. I saw a case years ago with Paul Zimmerman, we thought it was pars planitis. But as we looked at it, uh, again, carefully with immersion ultrasound, it was a tumor, ended up being a dictioma. So they can fool you sometimes. So anyway, very nice job on the presentation. Great, thank you. I think that's it for today. Great job to all of the medical students. I think that they are still in their rotations for a little while. So uh, say hi, and if you have questions, let them know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.